inspiration and insights from Frontline Ministry. To the Nations is a podcast of Wheaton College, Illinois, that features Wheaton College Graduate School alumni, primarily Billy Graham scholars around the world. They share stories of God's activity in their lives and where they serve. The title reflects the nature of Jesus, the Son and Word of God being sent to the nations, and His followers also being sent to the nations. Please let us know you're listening by engaging on social media. Like, follow, share, subscribe, and comment. You can find us on wheaton.edu slash listen, and most places podcasts are found. For scholarship information for Wheaton College Graduate School, please visit wheaton.edu slash Billy Graham Scholarships. Hello, my name is April McLaughlin. I am the Billy Graham Scholarship Program Coordinator here at Wheaton College Graduate School in Wheaton, Illinois. Thank you for listening. Our guest today quoted 1 Peter 5.8 in his last newsletter after listing three incidents that affected members of his team through the children, unfortunately. The verse he quoted says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It certainly seemed to me after reading that newsletter that the enemy was attacking this team and harming the most vulnerable, the children. So today we're going to talk with John Eisenman, who graduated in 2020 from Wheaton with a master's in evangelism and leadership. He received the Billy Graham North American Missionary Award, which paid for his degree. He's repaying Wheaton through his ministry in Japan. Together, we're going to discuss church planting, the coffee shop work he's involved with, and some suicide prevention efforts that stand against this enemy's mission to kill. So, John, you are like 14 hours ahead of me, I think. So thank you for getting up so early to talk with me. Oh, thank you very much, April. It's my pleasure to be here. I love that I can share about what's going on in Japan. I'm glad you can, too. I remember it's like one of the most unreached people groups, and people don't think about Japan too much in that manner. Would you say that's true? Yes, it's true. Japan and the world of missions, people don't usually think of it because it's a developed country, one of the largest economies in the world, but yet the gospel presence is so minuscule with only about one half of 1% of the population being Christian. So that's only a few hundred thousand people in a whole country of 125 million. Wow. Reaching Japanese for Christ is a massive undertaking, so it's good you're a marathon runner, John. Let's talk more about that toward the end of our conversation. You just graduated from Wheaton in 2020. So what are some good memories or highlights from your time at Wheaton? Yeah, Wheaton, that was a great time, the two and a half years that I was there. I just squeaked it in just before COVID. I made it uh, seven trips from Japan to Wheaton uh, to get my degree. What I valued so much was the in-person classes and all of these people and backgrounds and ministry experience and um, varying views, different denominational uh, theological beliefs uh, on the way that people practice what they're doing in ministry, all coming together. And we had great conversations. We were able to really discuss what we were learning and get different viewpoints. And just that diversity in the body of Christ and people coming together with that common cause to learn and to grow you know, to advance the kingdom of God. That was really fantastic. And I enjoyed uh, every one of my classes. I just want to say I didn't pay him to say that. So let's move to Japan then and, and tell me about your ministry there and maybe start with what brought you to Japan. Well, Japan was an answer to prayer for me in the sense of when I entered into missions, I knew in my heart that I wanted to work with an unreached people group. But I'd started in missions in Brazil, in the Amazon basin of Brazil. And Brazil has some interesting missionary challenges, especially in the Amazon, because of the logistical challenges of traveling around the Amazon River and the cost is high and it's very difficult lifestyle. And I was supporting national church planters there. But then the organization that I was working with called Paz International, they were sending a team of missionaries from Brazil to Japan in order to help uh, launch an international church plant that was focused on reaching out to uh, young people. And it was especially in response to the earthquake that happened in Japan in 2011. So after that time, uh, many people in Japan felt that the spiritual atmosphere changed and that many people became more open to spiritual conversations and, and it actually became easier for Japanese people to evangelize other Japanese So I was able to come as part of a team. Five families who came from Brazil came to Japan in 2014. 
Uh, and we came with that purpose to help establish a international bilingual English and Japanese church uh, in the greater Tokyo area. Oh, fascinating. So like, what's the culture of your team? Is it South American then? So our team is a mix. Uh, <laughs> we have some Brazilians, we have some Americans, and actually my wife is Brazilian, um, and we have some other cross-cultural marriages in our team. So uh, we often switch between English and Japanese and Portuguese oh. as we're having conversations, and we bring in some very um, dynamic parts of the of the culture from Brazil where people are very lighthearted and often uh, very agile and flexible and do a lot of things last minute. Uh, interesting parts of the Brazilian culture that are actually completely opposite of the culture that most Japanese people live. Yeah. So is that attractive to them? And are there sometimes conflict? Yeah, it's very interesting. Japanese people in general value planning and knowing things far in advance and no surprises. That's not usually how Brazilians operate. Um, <laughs> so those things are some interesting challenges that we as a team have to work to make sure that we're not, you know, scaring people away from the work that we're trying to do by being by seemingly being unprepared. Right. But you've seen some success, it sounds like. Yes, we have seen some success. One of the things, you know, that people tend to misconstrue with Japanese culture, they think that Japanese people are very quiet and calm and they're not, you know, they don't get animated or lively, but that's actually very untrue. Our experience with Japanese culture is that, you know, there's things like karaoke bars, right? right. Where people go and they get together with their friends and they sing their hearts out uh -huh. in a little room, you know, with their close friends uh -huh. and they do it for hours and hours. Uh -huh. Or it's widely known that Japanese people love gospel music from the U.S. Yes. Especially after the Sister Act movies came out, gospel music boomed all across Japan. And there's actually, our church has a ministry just reaching out to people through gospel music where they have a choir and people come and they love to dance and sing and clap and it's mostly in English and they sing the words and they learn the gospel by singing gospel music and we have several testimonies of people who came to faith in Jesus just because they came and they're introduced to the gospel by singing songs about Jesus Aww. and joy in Jesus yes when given the appropriate time and place, Japanese people are very willing to break out and be very animated and lively. It's actually very, very, very beautiful. So we want people to come and have that freedom to express themselves mm. because most people are looking for that because they don't get to do it in many other places. So what's the name of your church and where is it? So our church is called Paz Church. Paz is actually a Portuguese word that means peace. We are located in Noboritu, Kawasaki. So we're just outside of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. You're close to the train line, I assume. We're on the Odakyu train line, which um, connects. We're about a 17 minute train ride to Shinjuku station, which is the busiest mm -hmm. train station in the world. Oh, perfect. And there's a coffee shop there too. Is that right? That's right. So uh, one of the ministry strategies that we decided to launch into as we were planting our church was to establish a physical presence in the community that wasn't necessarily associated with being a church. Uh, there's a, a saying in Japan that says, the step into a church is a big step. And actually, it has a lot of deep meaning into it when you say it in Japanese. But the idea is that a Japanese person has a very difficult time of ever making it into the church. And of course, we understand that the church is not just a physical place, but we wanted to establish a place that people could be comfortable with so that when they would be, be invited by their friends or their or someone that they know to come and spend some time with us, they could come to a place that they already had been to once that they knew wasn't a scary place. Because many Japanese people will stay away from a church just because they don't understand what's happening there in a calm, relaxing environment where they can enjoy their time. And we have Christians working and we know that the, you know, of course the, the Holy Spirit is on our side and, and, and he's showing himself to people. So they come to us and they come to our Paz coffee shop. They're letting their guard down as they come in and they become familiar with the place. And then that gives us more opportunity later as a church to minister to them. Wonderful. And didn't you run the coffee shop yourself for a while? Yeah, so I've been involved with the project since the very beginning. Um, I'm essentially the business manager of the coffee shop. I was able to hire on some local people to manage the day-to-day -day operations, and we have several part-time staff. We tend to operate as a business for transformation style business. So we of course have some people from our church that are Christians and are working there, but we also have other non-Christians that we hired just, and of course we're witnessing to them the gospel through the way that we work as well. It sounds like such a fun environment, John. I would love to, to see it sometime. 
Oh, we would love to have you come. It's, <laughs> we do believe <laughs> that it's a great environment. So, yeah. Is it sometimes hard to keep that happy, joyful, open environment in the midst of the Japanese culture, though? Is there, do you feel the pressure? Um, sometimes it can feel difficult, but in general, I think that we carry with us Christ Jesus wherever we go. And of course, it's a daily thing that we're working on as Christians. Every morning mm -hmm. we're getting up and we're renewing our faith and renewing our vows with Jesus and we're um, going into the day. And But as Christians... And with all that Christ Jesus has done, done for us, there could be no greater joy that we have. And so it's really, uh, we count it as a privilege to be in a place where there's so much despair and depression and people that are struggling and going through difficult things all the time. But ambassadors of Jesus, we have, you know, we have a great opportunity to carry and express that joy. Oh, that sounds delightful. I think of the gambare part of the culture, you know, where you just work hard. It's so invasive. Yeah, that's the one of the key words that you learn it, learn it as a child very early. Gambare, you know, give it all you got. Mm -hmm. And it's used, of course, for all things. It carries a lot of meaning to it, but also carries a lot of pressure. Yes, definitely. And then that sort of leads us into this, this topic of suicide. So many of these social pressures, work pressures, financial pressures. I think a lot of people think of Japan and the high suicide rate. So your church has tried to make a dent in this with a Christian perspective, which is unique. So tell us about that ministry. Yeah, thanks, April. I, I really love to talk about this because it is one of the main felt needs that Japan has. Um, Japan actually... Uh, in the late 2000s, like 2008, 9, 10, in that time frame, experienced a super high suicide rate. And they had maybe close to 30,000 suicides per year at that time. So the government started doing a big push to reduce the suicide rate. And they have done a good job. I mean, it's dropped down to more recently closer to 20,000 suicides per year. And they are trying to keep lowering it. But during the same time, actually, the suicide rate for children has increased. And so the government has many resources that people can find for suicide prevention, but there's hardly any, there's maybe some, but very little suicide prevention work being done with a Christian faith background. And so that was the gap that we saw was that, you know, we can work hard as a society to prevent suicide, but ultimately it's not fixing the underlying problems, which is basically that people have no hope. And that's as Christians, one of the greatest gifts that we can give to somebody is a hope that their life is not being lived in vain. So we make it very clear on our suicide prevention outreach, it's, it's called Choose Life. So we have a website that we're using. Uh, we're using ads so that we can reach people that are out on online searching for suicide related topics. We make it very clear that we're Christians and we're not counselors, but we are Christians that have Jesus and we are willing to talk with anybody and hear their story and we we'll pray with you and we want to make it known that there is hope for you. Our prayer is that that would be reaching the people. And even if we don't know about it, we hope that that can be seeds that we're planting into people. Maybe for most people, it's their first time they've ever heard of the Christian God. Mm -hmm. And so if we can be a part of that and be blessing the, the greater kingdom work that's being done in Japan, then, then that's our privilege. Yeah. So how do people get connected with, with help then through the website? Yeah. So people will be directed through our ads that we run. Like we just run Google ads. So mm. when people search things in their browser, then it, it'll pop up an ad for our Choose Life website. And they'll have a little blip that says they can come and contact us. And then they come and, and they can send us a chat or they can send us an email, or actually in Japan, one of the social media messaging platforms they use is called Line, mm -hmm. and they can send us a message on Line. So wherever they're at online, they can contact us. Right now we have about uh, eight volunteers that are available at different times of the week. And so we try to have some dedicated times in the evening that people can uh, come and chat with us live. Uh, otherwise, if it's not during that time, they may send us an email or still send us a message and then we get back to them as soon as we can. What we're doing is we're being present for people to listen to their story and to pray for them and to share with them the hope that there is in, in Jesus. So the topic of suicide is very heavy, of course, and it's a difficult topic to get into for most people. But once they see that we're not trying to fix the person's problems, but we're just pointing them to what the ultimate solution is. And so that's a little bit of a change in perspective. And how long have you been doing this ministry? So this ministry has been going on in total uh, for about four years. Currently, 
uh, we've been seeing a very steady stream of people that come and contact us. I, I think, of course, we started from scratch and we've been growing and uh, improving the ministry year over year. Uh, and most recently, we are getting um, at least one contact per day, uh, sometimes multiple contacts per day. And in the past two years, we've had almost 3,000 conversations with people. Wow. Uh, that are coming to us and looking for for help. I hope a lot of lives have been saved because of this. Would you say that's the case? That's our prayer. We know of uh, at least two people that have come to faith, um, and we have other people that we've been able to connect with other churches in different parts of Japan. You know, we, we love to have stories of things that happen, but sometimes I think that we're just not going to know uh, what was the ultimate impact uh, on the lives of the people that contacted us. One thing that we really have noticed as a church is that many people that come to church, they had exposure to the Christian faith when they were a child. Mm -hmm. And that's either through maybe a church nearby them that was doing a vacation Bible school, or maybe they went to a Christian preschool, heard the gospel, or they heard stories from the Bible as a little child. And then that was the doorway for them later to not have the that same skepticism about Christianity. So they had a positive experience in the past and maybe some seeds were sown. Right. I know a lot of people, right, get married in the church or, or have some kind of semblance of a church wedding ceremony too in Japan. Yes, that's right. So many Japanese people, uh, they'll say that they are born Shinto and they're married Christian and they die Buddhist. Uh -huh. So that's an, in an interesting part of Japanese culture that many people uh, see the Western style church wedding and then they and they want to have that. You know, you'll see many chapels all over Japan that they're not churches, they're just wedding chapels and they're made to look like a Western church building. There's people that dress up as pastors and they have wedding ceremonies as if it were a Christian wedding ceremony. That fake so maybe that's too strong, but the patina maybe of of something that's not actually true. You see that in the wedding ceremonies, but it seemed like you were telling me before that maybe they don't sense relationships are real or deep either. And so that's part of the draw with this group of believers here at Paz Church. Is that what you'd say? Yeah, that's one of the biggest reasons that we hear from people on why they come to Paz Church and what is their like one thing they take away and that is that we work very hard to have authentic relationships. There's several ways that we do that but we're working against a system. Japan has special words to express what's meant to be for public viewing and what's meant for private. So in essence you have a part of yourself that you is never shown to the public and you have the other facade or the outward looking part that is meant for everybody to see and those are meant to be separated. Mm -hmm. Homai and Tatemai. Okay. So it's like the real you and the outside you. Mm -hmm. And so these are structures that are built into Japanese culture and language, you know, that keep people locked into very rigid relationships. And as soon as you meet somebody, you, you kind of have to figure out where you stand in relation to each other so that you know how to talk to one another. And then the relationship rarely deviates from that kind of standard interaction. So people, when they come to a church that's has people that are expressing genuine relationship and they're loving each other and caring for one another and it's open and there's no condemnation to share your struggles and to open up and talk to people. As people start to experience those kinds of relationships, it's really like nothing they've ever experienced, even in their family. You know? So then people are coming and they're experiencing these things and then it just fills them up fills them with joy and they're finding something that is available really nowhere else. More than 20 people came to our Easter service this year, people that have no idea anything about Christianity. And 20 people showed up that were invited by their friends oh. uh, just to come and see what we were doing. Oh, well, that's amazing. Now, do you have small groups too? Our main focus as, how, as to how we provide these relationships at Paz Church is, uh, is through our family groups. And we think that's where the true relationships can, can take place. That's where the actual pastoring of the people can take place. So we make it our effort to get as many people as possible into a family group. They're going to get to know people and walk together in the Christian faith together. I 
think Japan is maybe called like the graveyard of missionaries, right? It's it's such a difficult spot to serve, and a lot of people give up or they're forced to leave for some reason. And like you mentioned, the stats on how unreached the people group is. So what is going on over there? Years and years of efforts. So what is the enemy's hold on Japan? That's one of those um, unfortunate or, you know, those sayings that you hate to hear, right? The graveyard of missionaries. It's not really a very uh, inspiring tagline to get <laughs> new workers on the field here. Uh, but some of it comes with the intrigue of Japanese culture is its peculiarity. You really have to become a student of culture or a student of the people you're serving in Japan. And of course, that's true any in any cross-cultural, intercultural work that you're doing. But Jap- Japanese culture is uh, takes a lot of work to study and the language is very difficult. Relationships traditionally are very slow to form. One of the things is that is required for missionaries in Japan is really a high call to persevere. And so that's where you get the idea that it's a graveyard for missionaries because many people come and they're expecting something great to happen. And then after a year and two and three, and even to me, seven years, and I still you know struggle with the language and blundering cultural relations and interactions sometimes you know those are difficult things that that tend to weigh on you as a missionary so we really encourage people when you're going to come to japan you know it's it's a calling to persevere and we believe you know that japan is just as jesus said you know the harvest is ripe here and we've seen that we see people coming to faith um and we need laborers so we call laborers you know but it's also prudent to count the cost when we do all those things just as jesus told us to do then of course the the results of that are in his hands but our our, our calling is to persevere so when we were there we felt like within the church there wasn't a lot of teaching about the holy spirit and how to live by the spirit walk by the spirit stand firm in the spiritual battle what are your thoughts about that john I believe that has to be uh, one of the main things that we talk about as a church, because if there's one thing that separates us from any other religion, it's that we have, you know, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. If we don't realize that and tap into that, then we're to be fools, right? Uh, Because our Japanese culture around us is very good at doing religious rituals. There's a lot of that going around. So if we're just showing up and giving another list, another book full of rules or you know, something that people have to do to be in connection with God. Well, Japan already has a lot of that. People go to shrines and they go to places where they think they're encountering a God. We know that, you know, that's idolatry. We work hard to, you know, to share with people what it means to have a God that resides inside of you uh, and is with you all the time. You know, he's our comforter. He's the source for that joy that uh, we get to live out as Christians. We should use the Holy Spirit for the building up of the body. You know, those are the gifts of the Spirit that we all possess and that we use those and we want to practice them as like a muscle, practicing them and using them all the time to bless the greater body of Christ. So I imagine prayer is in focus as well. How did your team respond when all these things happened recently that harmed your your team? Yeah, that was a really difficult time, April. We had been through a summer where um, several of our team members uh, had been back on deputation back in the U.S. And we were getting ready for a new season, a new push of ministry. And and we had scheduled a time of fasting. Just leading into that, you know, we were expecting to celebrate um, the birth of a new baby from one of our teammates. Two weeks before the baby is scheduled, you know, scheduled to be delivered, you know, get the news that the heart has stopped beating. At the time, our team rallied together and we got together. We had people in Brazil and people in the U.S. And we set up a Zoom call, I think, that went for more than 30 some hours where we got together and we prayed and interceded. And, you know, as a parent, I have five boys myself. There couldn't be anything harder than to see your dear friends and close teammates to lose a baby after eight and a half months. You know, so that was really difficult. And we prayed and, you know, we were hoping for a miracle and we were believing. Uh, and it didn't happen in the, exactly the way that we had hoped. Now we've been in, in a grieving process as a team, but of course processing, you know, what does it mean to stand firm in your faith? What does it mean when, you know, the, the devil is around and he's devouring things? Or how do we stand firm in that? And that's, you know, that's again to our calling to persevere. You know, if there's one thing that we can show uh, as a team through this is that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the things that happen around us, we're still standing firm in our faith and that our ultimate joy is in Jesus. In the end, we know the outcome, the final outcome. 
so we can rejoice in that. Um, but it was a it was a very difficult season shortly after the passing of the baby. Then uh, dear friends as well, part of our team that we were just trying to get away for a couple of days on a short camping trip and their uh, five year old boy stumbled into a pot of boiling water and we had to take him to the emergency room and he has second degree burns. And we had another teammate that recently their three year old boy seems to be showing some signs of developmental disabilities on the autism spectrum. So they needed to take a season. They're back in the US right now um, seeking some early intervention to try to you know figure out the best way that they can help their three year old son. And of course, we love them and want them to do that and do what's best for their for their children. You know, that's been a really difficult time. So it left us a little bit shorthanded here. And of course, we're grieving and we're, uh, you know, but at the same time, we're seeing the church is excited. And we just came back to an in person service after a two month break this past Sunday. It has probably been our best worship service that we've had in two years time. Really? And it was just amazing. People are so un- loving to be together and praising Jesus together. And so it's really a beautiful thing. Yeah, we can see Japan as a only a half a percent of the people are Christian. And there's lots of stories of churches that are shrinking and dying out in Japan. And you know, that's the common narrative that we hear. But I see our church and other churches around that we have community with that are seeing people come to faith. They're planting new churches. We're hoping to plant the new church next year. So we're seeing signs of life and we're seeing the harvest is ripe. It's plentiful. And so we're just really believing and praying, God, that we, as as the church in Japan, we could enter in, into a season of reaping, you know, because all of many missionaries have spent decades and their lifetimes here investing and working in Japan to only see one or two people come to faith and maybe they pass out a small church. You know, it's not to look down upon them, but it's rather to say, no, these are people that have laid the groundwork and they've paid a price for other missionaries that are coming and now are building on top of the work that has previously been done. And, and now, you know, we can reap and we can, you know, we can share the joy in that reaping together. Yeah, may it be so. Let's conclude and let's go back to your marathon running. Have you done a marathon, John? Now, actually, uh, uh, April, I have run six marathons uh, on three different continents. Amazing. Uh, so <laughs> that's one of my passions is running. I guess the trivia that most people don't know, though, is that uh, I, I used to weigh almost almost 300 pounds by running. Actually, uh, I was transformed uh, down to 175 pounds. <laughs> And so that became my passion. You know, that was a big part of uh, transformation in my life. And now I run for fun. That's amazing. So where were the six marathons? Yeah, so I've run uh, three in Brazil, one in Rio de Janeiro, one in Florianopolis, which are in southern Brazil, and also in um, the Amazon uh, basin one time. And then I ran Yokohama, Japan, which is nearby my home here. Mm. And I also most recently ran in Chicago and New York. Oh, okay. That's impressive. Thank you. Maybe hearing this will inspire some other people to to pick it up. Yeah, please get out there. If you're on the fence and don't know, just get out there and give it a try. Give it a try. Maybe you'll love it like I do. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's a great testimony. If people wanted to learn more about your ministry, how would they get a hold of you? We are supported by a wonderful team of people, mostly in the U.S., that are um, supporting us through prayer and finances. And so we are very thankful for all those people, and they really make it possible for us to be here. I have a website. And it's johnandsylvia.com. That's Sylvia with an I. So johnandsylvia.com. We are sent by Paz International, pazinternational.org. And you can find out more about um, the greater work that we're doing in Brazil and in different parts of the world. Excellent. And do you have a book or a resource recommendation? If you're interested in what's going on in Japan and what it's like to do church planting, there's a great book by a missionary in Japan that just moved off the field. And his book is called Sowing the Gospel in Japanese Soil. And the author is uh, John Men, M-E-H-N. Very good. So would you lead us in a brief prayer for Japan then, John? I sure would. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much that uh, I could be here with April and we could be talking about the great things that is happening in the kingdom of God in Japan. Father, thank you that you love the Japanese people even more than we could. And you more than anybody, uh, by showing us your, you know, by being patient with us, Father, you're giving us a chance to to continue to reach Japanese people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we just pray, Lord, that gospel would penetrate deeply, that it would indeed be seeds planted in the soil, and that they would come and bear great fruit for the nation of Japan. Lord, 
that in spite of all the brokenness and the difficulties of things that are happening here, that your gospel would rise up and shine forth and people would come to know Jesus and profess him as their Savior, as their Lord, and that indeed Japan would experience, Lord, a great revival of church planting and, and gospel revival, renewal for this country. So thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for already showing us, Lord, just that this is just the start of what you're doing in Japan. So thank you, and I uh, just pray you bless each person that's listening to this today, and I pray that it, uh, it would inspire more people to turn their hearts toward Japan and be invested in, in what you're doing here. We thank you, Lord, so much, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, John. This was really encouraging. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you very much, April. I'm. It was my pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, and I wish you well with all those boys in your family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and blessings on your wife, too. Yes, yeah, she's the real trooper in the family. Thank you for listening. John gave us a coaching session. He didn't focus on the spiritual battle facing the team. Rather, he emphasized the power of the gospel for all who believe and acknowledged the perseverance needed to serve in Japan. May you be encouraged to pick up the baton and run with endurance the race that is set before you in 2022. Next time we'll celebrate our one-year anniversary with a montage of the best of 2021. 